Star Trek 3 The Search for Spock had done what it set out to do, find Spock and pop him on something. Why would you do this? Paramount wanted another Star Trek film and the result turned out to be the much hoped for crossover movie where people who didn't know Captain Kirk from Kirk Cameron would show up to theatres in their droves. Star Trek 4 The Voyage Home. <sighs> it's the one with the whales. <laughs> Trust me. Implicitly. Large mushroom pepperoni with extra onions and a Michelob, please. Following on from the unexpected success of Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, Leonard Nimoy offered to direct a third Star Trek film in order for him to return as Spock. Spoilers, they found him. When Star Trek III Search for Spock did well enough, Paramount handed director Leonard Nimoy and producer Harve Bennett a bigger budget and told them to go wild, though not too wild, because you know they had a phone bill due on the 14th and the kids were getting braces and also there's alimony payments and their new partner wanted a solid gold bidet. Nimoy and Bennett set to work on a script, something they would often describe to others as nice. Certainly the biggest cockamamie fish story I've ever heard. You asked. Star Trek IV would be a light adventure based around the crew of the former Starship Enterprise traveling back in time to the then present day. What does it mean, exact change? There would be no actual villain and no one would die in the film. Normally that's less of a movie and more of an outtake from a high school science film called The Skolex and You. Various scriptwriters were brought in to craft a storyline, but for a while there was a wrinkle in that superstar Eddie Murphy had expressed an interest in appearing in a Star Trek film. How you doing? After Beverly Hills Cop hit, Murphy was one of the hottest stars in Hollywood, but Paramount had reservations about combining two franchises. Murphy dropped out of the project in order to make The Golden Child, and his proposed character would be merged with another as the marine biologist character played by Katherine Hicks. You're from outer space. No, I'm from Iowa. I only work in outer space. Final versions of the shooting scripts were split between Harve Bennett, who wrote the scenes in the 23rd century at the beginning and end of the film, while Wrath of Khan writer and director Nick Meyer returned to write the scenes set in the then present day. No, ma'am, no dipshit. In the previous film, Kirk and his bridge crew stole the soon-to-be mothballed Enterprise to reunite Spock's regenerated body with his mind. They were successful, but the Enterprise was destroyed. When Spock was resurrected, they had restored his mind by way of a backup implanted in McCoy's head. But rolling back to an earlier version hasn't quite restored Spock's understanding of humans and emotions. Of course, McCoy being a bit of a dick, he gets a kick out of goading a slightly perplexed Spock. Forgive me, Doctor. I'm receiving a number of distress calls. I don't doubt it. Mr. Spock, of course, is playing the long game, letting McCoy think he's won this one, and he will wait decades to get his revenge. On Earth, the Klingons are baying for Kirk's blood, which lets us know the situation is serious. A mysterious alien probe, or massage gun, I forget which, approaches Earth and saps the planet of all of its energy. Starships are rendered useless, and the Earth itself is up the creek without a tricorder. It just so happens that Kirk and his crew were en route for Earth in their commandeered Klingon bird of prey when they received the Earth's distress call. Spock surmises the probe is waiting for an answer that's not forthcoming. Who would send a probe hundreds of light years to talk to a whale? Spock provides the details, but it's James T. Kirk who pieces it together. If not for the crew, then for the audience. The probe has come to Earth to find out why the mysterious unseen and unnamed aliens had stopped receiving signals from Earth's humpback whales. And with the species having been hunted to extinction, there's no answer and nothing to stop the probe from laying waste to the planet. In other words, Earth is royally screwed. Start your computations for time warp. Uh, that's no biggie. I once attempted time travel, but all I ended up doing was getting a load of one-winged butterflies really pissed off at me. You're proposing that we go backwards in time, find humpback whales, then bring them forward in time, drop them off, and hope the hell they tell this probe what to go do with this cell. That's a general idea. In the past, the crew are totally out of their element. Judging by the pollution content of the atmosphere, I believe we have arrived at the latter half of the 20th century. In San Francisco of the late 80s, we know it's the present day because there's funky saxophone music. McCoy, Sulu and Scotty have to try and make a water tank in the Klingon ship. Uhura and Chekhov have to collect some particles from a nuclear reactor in order to have the energy to return to the 23rd century. And Spock and Kirk find a pair of whales at a local cetacean institute and make plans to offer the humpback a ride to the 23rd century. Whales are peaceful creatures with no idea of the danger of accepting a lift from a stranger. They like you very much, but they are not the hell your whales. I, I suppose they've told you that, huh? 
The hell they did. Kirk and Spock also meet Gillian, a marine biologist who's very attached to the whales and saddened when she reveals the whales will soon have to be set free, where they will be at the mercy of whale hunters. When we say whale hunters, we mean actual whale hunters, not your neighbours John Whale and Mary Hunters, who recently got married and became John and Mary Whale Hunters. Convincing Gillian of their good intentions without giving the game away is hard. You're not exactly catching us at our best. That much is certain. None of this is helped by Kirk having a very inconsistent grasp of 20th century history and slang. I think he did a little too much LDS. And Spock, who has no idea about what the hell is going on. Neither of them has a good grasp of how to use profanity properly. Nobody pays any attention to you unless you swear every other word. I should know I am a goddamned f***ing c of a smirking expert. About those colourful metaphors that we've discussed. Kirk tries to charm Gillian in a more informal atmosphere without clueless Spock cramping his style, a move he's come to know as Spock blocking. Entertainment tonight must have been run on the shoestring since their reporter had to moonlight as a waiter to make ends meet. There's a bit of a wrinkle though, as Chekhov was captured on board the USS Enterprise, no not that one, the other one, and after a failed escape attempt, takes a tumble. Kirk, McCoy and Gillian free Chekhov before rushing to save the two whales from Whale Hunters, who it turns out is actually John Whale Hunters, and his son-in-law, Chad Ambergris. There be whales here! Then it's back to the 23rd century where they can release the whales and the future is saved. Huzzah! Then the crew must face justice for attacking Starfleet personnel, sabotaging, sorry, sabotaging Excelsior, stealing and destroying the Enterprise, etc. All serious charges that would ordinarily command a long prison sentence and a dishonourable discharge. Of course, Kirk has just saved the planet Earth, so jailing him would be somewhat on the awkward side, like returning a rental car with both passenger doors missing. In the end, all charges are dropped. Disobeying orders of a superior officer is directed solely at Admiral Kirk. And Kirk gets busted down to captain and given a new starship, which turns out to be the Enterprise NCC 1701A. You and your crew have saved this planet from its own short sightedness. With that, the inadvertent trilogy that had begun with Wrath of Khan was wrapped up with an awfully neat bow. So neat, you can tell that I didn't tie it. We gotta find some humpbacks. Humpbacked people? Whales, Mr. Scott, whales. Star Trek IV The Voyage Home is one of those rare movies where almost, and I mean almost everything works. How much would you give me for them? Excuse me, weren't those a birthday present from Dr. McCoy? And they will be again, that's the beauty of it. Whenever those pesky laws of time threaten to stop the plot, the script points out the flaw, shrugs its shoulders, like pointing to the no-smoking sign, nodding and then lighting up anyway. You uh, realize, of course, if we give him the formula, we're altering the future. Why? How do we know he didn't invent the thing? Even without a specific villain, the tension ramps up. They find the whales, but there's time pressure to get them out soon. The ship's power source is frazzled and they might be stuck in the 20th century. They find a solution to the power problem, but Chekhov is left behind. They finally get Gillian on their side, but Chekhov's now in hospital. They find the whales, but there's a whaling ship. They get back to the 23rd century, but the whales are stuck in the hold. This movie is always hustling along, like an influencer trying to get a free meal. <laughs> Unbelievable. The banter between the characters is pitch perfect, with most of the supporting characters getting to stretch themselves a little further. I find it hard to believe that I've come millions of miles. Thousands. Thousands. Thousands, thousands of miles. James Doohan and DeForest Kelly haven't had too many comedic scenes between them to date, but their scenes together here are hilarious. Computer. Ah. Hello, computer. Michelle Nichols and Walter Kaner get the espionage storyline, which also gives us Chekhov's defining moment of the entire franchise. It's where they keep the nuclear vessels. Nuclear vessels. George Takei's big scene of him meeting an ancestor was cut during post-production, and in the end, he just borrows a helicopter. Catherine Hicks is the only character from the 20th century with more than a few lines of dialogue and is the film's anchor. She's like a lot of people who saw this as their first Star Trek film. You can see her trying to work out what the deal is with these guys. Amanda Wyatt and Mark Lennon reprise their roles as Spock's parents, and Robin Curtis shows up briefly as Lieutenant Savick, again exchanging awkward glances with Spock. Glances which mean much less since the intended baby Spock daddy idea was nixed. 
You know, they've all attended Starfleet Academy in San Francisco, so they really should not need to ask for directions to Alameda. But anywho, I've seen this movie dozens of times and this scene just makes me laugh each time. Even this woman who wasn't an extra or involved with the film in any way, but was just somebody passing by. I think it's across the bay, in Alameda. That's what I said, Alameda. Alameda. I know. The one-two punch of William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy traveling together is just gag after gag. The comedy is organic, arising from the characters and situations, and it works brilliantly. No need to put xylophones or clarinets on the soundtrack. You guys like Italian? No. Yes. Yes. No. no. Yes. No. Yes. I love Italian. And so do you. Yes. Of course, if you take a closer look at how the film is structured, you'll see that Kirk is always the one to put everything together. The other characters will give Kirk the information, but it's Kirk who has to weigh everything up and make a decision. Spock gives him the details, and Kirk tells everyone they're going back in time to get some whales. It's Kirk whose relationship with Gillian leads to the whales, and for some reason, Kirk just stands there in the background while Spock and his father Sarek have a moment of understanding between each other. Spock knows this as Kirk blocking. Why is Kirk everywhere? because it was made clear to the writers that this would make William Shatner very happy. Kirk also got a romance of sorts, but one that kind of fizzles out once they end up in the 23rd century. Like they say in your century, I don't even have your telephone number. <laughs> How will I find you? Of course, it won't be the last time Kirk is shot down in a Trek movie. By this point, this was the closest Captain Kirk had ever come to saying Star Trek's most quoted catchphrase. Scotty, beam me up. As luck would have it, an old water tank was discovered underneath a parking lot at Paramount. Back in the day, it had been used for any number of scenes requiring a lot of water. It was excavated and returned to use as a massive water tank for use in several scenes, including the ending. Most of the whales used in the movie are mechanical effects, effects which have come a long way since the crude shark Bruce used in the first Jaws film. Leonard Rosenman provided the score. It's upbeat and exactly what you'd expect of an 80s comedy movie soundtrack with an orchestral score. It's not one of the top flight Trek scores, but it is serviceable and does the job. A favourite scene for many in this film is where Spock and Kirk are on a bus trying to get another passenger to turn down his boombox. The punk was played by the film's associate producer Kirk Thatcher, who'd also come back to play the same role decades later. For a film that fires on all thrusters for most of its runtime, there are only a few bits where things didn't work out so well. The abstract visuals during the time travel sequence of 3D computer-generated busts of one character morphing into another is probably the main WTF moment of the entire film. It's mercifully short, and once you see Kirk arguing with a cab driver, you soon forget. And then you wake up in the middle of the night eight weeks later and remember the scene. What the hell was all that about? But you put it out of your mind. Years go past, you go through life, raise a family, and suddenly one evening you catch a screening of The Voyage Home on television and you're reminded of this bloody scene. The horror, the night sweats and the bed wetting begin all over again. On second thought, maybe it was because I had driven the car off the road and ended up in a lake. Not for the first time or the last time, but Star Trek was about something. Star Trek, a franchise about making friends with your enemy, not hunting down and killing everybody who crosses you, still surprises some people who have watched the entire series and the movies, and their takeaway is that the series motto is, every man for themselves. Here, the point is as obvious as, why well, look at William Shatner performing his own stunts underwater. That's some marvelous work there. Uh, the stunt's okay too. To hunt a species to extinction is not logical. It's not the first time Star Trek had some message, but it was one of the few films where it was vital to the plot. Spock, you're talking about the end of every life on Earth. You're half human. Haven't you got any goddamn feelings about that? Humanity hunted the whales to extinction, and hundreds of years later, the planet is almost destroyed by the whales' friends coming to ask why the humpbacks stopped answering their texts. Apparently, the last message received by the aliens from the whales was, Harpoon, where? Of course, would the movie have been as warmly received if the whole film was about Kirk and co returning to Earth to collect giant spiders? It's not uncommon for people to devour something like Star Trek and completely miss the point of the story. So watch Star Trek 4 and pay attention. And if at the end of it you think to yourself, oh, hunting whales sounds like a fun vacay. Very little point am I trying to explain. ILM again provided visual effects here and do a generally excellent job throughout the movie. 
Almost all of the previous films had been filmed on a soundstage, but Voyage Home's extensive location filming gives the movie a texture unlike any other in the franchise. This is a wonderful film in almost every way, and for a long time was the only Star Trek film that many non-sci-fi fans had seen. The film's plot has urgency without any need for a physical villain, it has comedy that springs naturally from the characters and the situations, and no other Star Trek film, even a good one, was ever this much fun. Just use the keyboard. The keyboard. How quaint. The film did very well when it was released in late 1986 and would remain the highest grossing Star Trek film until 2009. Star Trek IV The Voyage Home would be the catalyst for several major events in the Trek franchise. One, another Trek film would happen, and this time it would be directed by another of its stars, William Shatner. I'm sure that will turn out just... Uh, never mind. God damn irresponsible. Also faced with the escalating salaries of the franchise's aging stars during the production of this film, Paramount had decided they want to pop Spocks on more things than just a medium budget movie starring a cast who were almost interchangeable with the cast of Cocoon. What the studio really wanted was the filthy Luca from a weekly series, and so even before Voyage Home was released, Paramount announced they would be making a new Star Trek television series with a completely different cast. Eh, it'll never fly. I am from what on your calendar would be the late 23rd century. I've come back in time to bring two humpback whales with me in an attempt to repopulate the species. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos. Also, merch.